Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you have the mic? Hi. Oh, this mic is here. Yeah. Yeah, just do it. Yeah. So I was putting this back there, but no choice. So now we should have one as well. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone to the last session on uh, private information retrieval. We have two talks. Uh, the first is by Elit, who is in a superposition here and in, and in Israel. Uh, Elit does uh, fantastic work in succinct cryptography, and uh, today she will tell us about uh, the school line of work on uh, doubly efficient PIR. All right, thanks, Abhishek, and thanks for the workshop organizers for the invitation. Um, indeed, I will be talking about doubly efficient private information retrieval. This does not mean twice faster than something else, but I'll explain uh, very shortly what, what we're doing with this. Uh, and this is a collection, actually the original works, kind of the, what I'll be mostly talking about, are not new. They're back around 2017 or so. Um, so my main goal of this talk is to, to sort of show you what is out there and mostly what is not yet known yet. Um, and these are going to be, so this will be a big chunk of the talk, things that I want the audience to actually solve. Okay, but getting started. So the focus indeed is this notion of private information retrieval. Um, this was originally considered in a multi-server version. For today, I'm only going to be talking about the case where there's a single server. So here there's a server that holds some N entry database and a client who wishes to access some item I in the database um, without revealing I to the server. So this is the privacy. Okay, and as sort of expected here, there'll be some sort of potentially interactive protocol such that at the conclusion, the client can recover the ith entry of the database. Um, the privacy is that for any possible pair of, of distinct indices that the server can't tell which index the, the client is actually requesting. And of course, a non-triviality requirement. Uh, so for example, the client can just download the entire NBIT database. Uh, this gives fantastic security. But we want this to be interesting. The non-triviality is the communication must be less than n. And interestingly enough, it turns out even as, as soon as you get to one bit less than n, this already inherently requires public key cryptography. Um, so for those who were uh, into this, it, it, it implies oblivious transfer. Okay. On the other hand, if you do have public key cryptography assumptions, so this is a list. Never mind the specifics, but each of these is sort of a relatively standard structured uh, assumption that does in particular imply public key cryptography. And based on an assortment of these things, uh, any one of them, 
then you can get single server peer uh, with very low communication. Okay, so, so really the focus has been on communication up to this point. A little bit of a minor shout out. So this is a very recent work um, of mine together with collaborators, Jafal Couteau and uh, my student, or our student rather, and where we can actually get the DDH, so decisional Dippy Hellman down to computational Dippy Hellman. It's actually, you know, when you look at it from, from the, after the solution, it's actually quite simple. Is it phase one SO or just regular? Okay, yeah. say that again. It's, it's the PIR that you get with all the log completion. Is this phase one uh, uh, as uh, was in prior work or is it uh, just uh, CDS, uh, the construction just from CDS PIR with all the log completion? Um, I'm, I can't hear you completely, but so the, this is just, it doesn't go through like this. Um, so, so sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> is it a read one or just like regular? No, 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 just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just st standard, uh, but in fact, it has multiple rounds of interaction and so forth. But the new thing is just the assumption. What, what is the database size? Huh? No, the communication uh, process. Oh, so, so, so each database entry is very large, right? And that's what each database doing. entry is large, let's say a gigabyte, the communication from the server back is like uh, proportional to the entity. Uh, yeah, the truth is we haven't really thought about that. We were just looking at the um, single bit case. Maybe it's worth looking into. Okay, so that is not the focus of this talk, um, but rather I want to be shifting, not just at looking at communication, which is what's mostly been looked at here, um, but shifting to the, the question of what about the computation that's required, okay? So if you look at these, these wonderful protocols, typically the computation on the client side is quite low. We're happy with this, some polylog in the database size, but unfortunately the computation on the server side is big, okay? This is inherent, you cannot in fact hope to do less than that, as if you, if you just start with the database like this. Okay, kind of intuitively this makes sense because for example, if the server doesn't touch one of the database items, this already gives some, some indication, some bias that this was not the, the index that was queried. Okay, so this, this is something that we're a bit stuck with, okay, or are we? So the, the, the focus of, of today, of this talk and also the talk that's coming up next is going to be looking at how can we come up with ways of getting around this impossibility. Okay, the first, which is um, mostly what, what uh, Alexandra will be talking about in the next talk. Suppose, for example, that the client can batch a collection of queries. Okay, and this can either be sort of all at one shot or maybe they come adaptively, but you require some sort of amortized computation. Okay, so this, this work, this is exactly what the next talk will be about. Um, achieves really nice properties where the, the amortized computation time, this is on the server side, is only square root of the database size. Okay. Uh, the sort of the downside or, or the thing that comes along with this is that the client as part of this process has to maintain extra storage. Uh, in their case, it's, it's roughly square root as well. And in fact, in some sense, they show that this is inherent. Okay. So, more specifically, if, I, if this is some server communication time T, uh, sorry, computation time T, and if S here is denoting uh, the client storage, they prove that for adaptive queries coming from, I'm batching together, this is amortized across queries, but they're adaptive, then this product has to be at least N. So for example, this, this is already kind of, in some sense, the best kind of trade-off that you can get. Um, they also show if you have non-adaptive queries, uh, they still can show something. And this, this was uh, actually matched already with this previous work, um, the, the kind of trades off. So for example, in the extreme, if I have N queries I'm trying to batch together, I can even just download the whole database, right? And I get really good amortized complexity. Okay, so this is also not what I'm going to be talking about, sort of a system of decoys here. Um, instead, I'm going to be looking at a different direction of how to bypass this uh, this computation cost. So, so, so I guess this is apparent already from your bullet, but those works don't, they keep the database just as- this is exactly the next sentence I was about to say, exactly. So, so this these works do not touch the database. So this was back here, the database is stored exactly as is. And these, these uh, lower bounds are in that setting, exactly, okay? So indeed, another thing that you could consider doing, sort of relaxing, is what if we do some sort of pre-processing on the database? Okay, so for example, the, the server can, can store some encoded version where you've pre-processed some information. 
Okay, and this, this uh, notion was first put forth back by Bayman et al. in 2000 by the name of peer with pre-processing. Um, here, just kind of for, for completeness, I also want to put out that there are some lower bounds here, no? So, um, so if I have time t and server extra hint storage s, okay, so before this s was on the client, this is on the server side, um, then we do know that s times t has to be at least n log n. But for example, if I'm okay with storing you know, say another copy of, of the database size or even a bit more here, you can hope to get um, the T very, very small. Okay. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, so kind of one of so some of the benefits here, for example, in some sense, uh, a benefit of, of this bullet versus this bullet is that you can, if, if I sort of push the extra storage or something to, to the server, then the client can still be very cheap in terms of not only kind of computation and, and also storage. You'll see why and there are other reasons why this bullet is better as well. So <laughs> wait for that. Okay. Okay, so this, again, this is going to be the focus and I wanna sort of open this up even a little bit further. Um, fortunately, this got cut off here. So this should say standard one server private information retrieval. Good news is that this is here just as a baseline. This is like the version that does need a lot of computation. Um, I, I want to mention, so probably uh, some of you in the audience have heard of this notion of oblivious RAM. This is also something whose goal is to hide access patterns into data. Um, it's a little bit in, in an orthogonal direction. Um, and the reason sort of the difference is that with ORAM, oblivious RAM, the server in every single stage is allowed to change what's being uh, held. And you're kind of local, you know, so this is tied to a single client and the server can keep updating what's stored on the, the server side. Okay. Um, so sort of a distinction here with this line is that this pre-processing, peer with pre-processing in here is going to be you one time, one shot pre-process the database and now that's, that's stored as is. So you don't have to kind of maintain state on the server side. Okay, so what am I putting in here? Well, <laughs> uh, even when I say peer with pre-processing, there's different questions about in particular, who's doing the pre-processing, okay? So the original notion, which is like the one that you'd really like, is that the server does the pre-processing, okay? There's no secrets involved. The server takes the thing, encodes it, and there's nothing to, to hide in that process, and you can go for it. Uh, so they were able to show in this, this 2000 work that in the multi-server private information retrieval setting, you can get some savings. Um, but nothing is still to, to this day is known in the setting for the single server case. We just don't know. Okay, so this, this was sort of the state of affairs when uh, I got into the scene together with uh, Yuval and, and, and other co-authors. Um, and uh, and what, so <laughs> I'll mention, we kind of weren't even really sure, is this possible? Maybe it is possible. Maybe we can show it's impossible. Um, what we ended up looking at is, is a slightly weaker version Okay, where there's pre-processing, but, but secrets can be involved. Okay, so think of this as that, you know, ideally some magical thing where we run some joint protocol. Okay, so somehow the database gets encoded, say a trusted Zeta. Okay, and now the server holds on to this information. Maybe there's some kind of public key. So this is called a, a public key version. Uh, and given this, now anybody can come along and, and, can, and can query this. Uh, by the way, so this, what is this thing? This is now finally the, the entrance of this doubly efficient peer. Um, <laughs> it's maybe not the best name, but it is a reasonably good name. Um, so doubly efficient in the sense that it's efficient for the client and also the server. So this is referring to the low computation time. Okay. Um, so this, this is kind of like a next best thing. Maybe it's not perfect, but we can imagine settings. Maybe we all do some sort of trusted setup. Okay, but now we're even kind of backing off a little bit more and something that we can get a firmer grasp on, which is a weaker version where the pre-processing is done by the client. So now this kind of shifts over. This is like a per client setting versus we'd like it to be that any client comes along. Uh, and let me try to kind of justify still this, this setting. One justification is that, and uh, you can show actually with obfuscation, so kind of at least heuristically, this gives us a construction 
that you can boost from this setting to to this setting. So, so, that, so the public key version, right? Uh, the way I think about it, the way I could think about it, and you can correct me, is I have a database. I want everybody to access it, right? So mm -hmm. I'm going to run the pre-processing, uh, put it up on your server, yes. and then publish the public key. For example, that's, right? that's great, actually. Uh, and the other one is I have a database but only I want to access it. It's sort of an outsourcing kind of thing. Ah, so maybe, maybe I should uh, mention though. So whoever is doing this pre-processing, if they keep the secret information, then they can actually learn what's being queried. So that's this right. is, so has if be. that's, yeah, if you're okay, if there's somebody who's okay to reveal that too, then they can do the pre-processing. Right. But, but for example, you can- You can secret your Exactly, yeah, exactly. You can, yeah, exactly. So you, you know, I mean, I mean more of an MPC person actually than a private information retrieval person. So <laughs> you can imagine doing this setup via some protocol where as long as you assume that that they're not colluding with each other, then you're sort of emulating this trusted third party. It's the same setting as ORAM, right? Model of interaction. So in ORAM, you also keep a secret as a client. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So it kind of puts it, yeah, this is yeah, this uh, suggestively is getting closer to, to ORAM. Except yeah. in ORAM, you, you modify the database every time yeah. you make the question. Yes, yes. Yes, right. yes exactly. Yeah. So, for public key preprocessing, but it's leaking here, the server can do it itself, or it has to be an external? It needs the, the, the point, I guess, is that the preprocessing involves secrets that the server, server should not know. So, whoever holds on to these secrets would be able to. A, identify what's being queried later on, so for example. In public key preprocessing, yeah. yeah, there's no really, there aren't like inherent the secrets, but during the process of processing secrets. Like the key gen algorithm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so like in a CRS model, yeah, you have to also universally sample a way of, yeah, it's a bit complicated. So it's a, yeah, exactly. If, if you're okay with obfuscation, then these are... <laughs> sort of one-time trust as opposed to every data. Yes, yes, yes that's, a, that's a good way. In the public key case, does, do the client have, do the clients have uh, the secret key or nobody has a secret Nobody key? has the secret okay. key, exactly. So this in this case, the clients need okay. the secret key to query. In this case, you kind of want to destroy the secret key. Nobody needs the secret key. And then just given the public key, you can query. Good. Okay, so um, so maybe let me kind of pause for a second. I've thrown out obfuscation here. This is a good time to mention that even if I give you ideal obfuscation, forget about VBB and fine tune, I give you a magic black box, it's still not clear how to solve this problem, even this problem here. Um, and this is, you know, I, I, this is one of the explicit challenge that I have later in my slides. Um, this is sort of, a surprising thing, or, or there are not a whole lot of natural goals uh, where, where if you throw obfuscation at it, that it doesn't immediately solve. So this is maybe one thing to keep in mind. In this case, um, yeah. So for example, you can think about the, the client does the pre-processing and pushes this, the, the database over, for example. So, so maybe actually I have some explicit slides that really give definitions of these things. So maybe for the fine tuning, um, I, the, the thing, the point that I want to, to kind of emphasize. So here, in order to query, I need the secret information that was used for the pre-processing. And here, there needs to be some secret information, but nobody needs to know it. In fact, you don't want anybody to know it. Thing yes, yes, yes. Like we one one shot, we do a multi-party thing. We generate it. Now it's completely like normal. Uh, there's just something out in the sky that everybody can use. So the client can talk to the server to create this. this uh, yes. Yeah. 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 For example. Good. Okay. So so now this this is sort of the spectrum here up here with pre-processing. Um, and now what, what do we really know about this? Uh, well, sort of the interesting and, and part of what I want to try to focus on today is that in this setting, we have a candidate construction. This is a two independent works back in 2017 um, that give us very small communications. So polylog uh, here, also polylog client storage, 
Uh, it does have, of course, sort of inherently the server storage needs to, to get bigger. It needs to be, so maybe it doesn't need to be this big, but it does need to get bigger. Um, so this is all fantastic. And the downside is that it's based on a new assumption. Uh, so downside in the sense it's not a standard cryptographic assumption, but maybe also uh, this will lead to some interesting additional questions. So that just to place the, uh, the, the other, the Alexandra et al work, right? Yes. So that fits into this box sort of, right? Uh, in the sense you have per client reprocessing as well. Yes. Uh, the, the amount of storage in the client is much larger. Yes. The server is much smaller. It really is. Handy. Yes. Yes. Uh, but also, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the, okay, good. So the, the down, so the positives of this, um, exactly the client storage is very small. Um, and also what well, you said something else. The server storage is large. So the server storage is large. The client storage is very small. The communication is small as well. The communication is small. And, uh, yeah, yeah, polylog versus square Sorry. root. Exactly. Um, but they can base on, on standard assumptions, and we have this new assumption. So, yeah, there's definitely like pros and cons. I think the bigger conceptual difference was like that, that one is targeted to one client, but like the one in the next talk, like, yeah. but the server stores is good for. That's not true. That's not true. Yeah, the client oh, stores the, the, I think the server does okay. just store the database. But there is a pre-processing that we do, that I do as a server and time, right? That with you, and I can only use that sort of, you know, um, so, so if, if I want to do it with Noah, I have to do it again. Sure, but each client gets like, again. Uh, yeah, I guess the it's like the, the same thing. The question is who stores this information, either it's stored on the client side or the server side. Okay, never mind. <laughs> You'll, we'll figure this out in the next talk, I guess. Okay, good. So, so this is sort of the state of, of affairs. And yeah, so kind of even, even all of these things building from even ideal obfuscation is just very interesting. Yes, this falls under the, a couple slides ago. Here we know that the server storage, this is like the additional on top of N. So if you have S additional hint bits, um, if that's zero, for example, then the time has to be. Time is the server computation time. Like black box models where time really needs like queries to something like that. Actually, that's a good question. I'm not sure. This is actually, I'm not sure. That's a good point. Yeah, this I'm not sure. I'll have to check. I think it is because I think that this, the, so, okay, this was in the original BIM paper, and this was improved with the log N, and this, um, this is Cristiano and Yao. And I think that, so this say uh, in their paper, I think they're looking at a case with their secrets, but I need to check that. Pre-processing time. Um, Pre-processing time. So in all these cases, it's polynomial, like the specific polynomial uh, we haven't looked so closely at. Leave that as an efficiency open question. For the lower bound, it doesn't matter. For the lower bound, I don't think it matters. No, it's like, yeah. Yes, yes. That's plus. Plus, plus. Say new assumption. Can we still being new? Like, this is there. This is good. He's a, a co author. So I think it's pretty much, it's been out there five years. It's an old, old assumption old. now. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty old. <laughs> it's pretty old. Um, I, I, how confident am I on the assumption? We'll get to that later. I, I would certainly not bet my life on it. Uh, but so far it's, it's held, so we'll see. Okay, um, yeah, so first of all, I, I, this, this is great, all the interaction, as we said before, Simon is, is really good for this. Um, because of that, I might need to skip over some later parts, but I'm totally cool with that. Okay, so this talk, um, first of all, kind of showing you the lay of the land. Um, I mostly just wanna tell you a couple odds and ends, interesting things about these three intermediate notions. Um, so this is based on who's doing the pre-processing mostly focusing on the weakest version of the secret key, DE pure. Uh, and I want to make sure that I have time at the end to, to tell a lot of open questions and challenges. Okay. 
So first of all, this is like the strongest version. Uh, and when we started on this, this, uh, this problem, I think about 50-50% of the time, we were either trying to build a construction or actually show that this is impossible. <laughs> um, but it turns out it's going to be challenging to show impossibility. And the reason is because you can do one of these uh, tricky sort of things. If, if some sort of dream data structure existed, maybe we don't expect this to exist, but we don't know how to prove it does not exist yet, then you would get uh, a construction. And just very briefly, so what is this dream data structure? Okay, suppose I have some way of converting a circuit the size, maybe k to the 100, to some uh, polynomial blow up data structure, such that evaluating the circuit on any input can be done by looking at some kind of small number of positions in the data structure, say k to the 10 uh, lookups. Okay, so suppose that such a thing existed. Now take your favorite two message standard, no pre-processing private information retrieval scheme. Okay, so this, whatever the server's doing here, um, a, this is something that takes a lot of time, right? This is the time to end in the existing constructions. But now view this as a circuit that has the database as a, inside of it. Now convert that circuit using your dream data structure. And given, given an input, which is like a query from the, the client, you can evaluate what would the circuit say by looking at a small number of positions in this data structure. Okay, this exactly gives you a peer with pre-processing. Um, so this, this is something we kind of observed in, in the 2017 paper. It's a related highly to something that's in the original Bimo et al. Uh, and as I said, what that means is that ruling out this, this uh, primitive uh, is going to require new data structure lower bounds, which <laughs> whenever I hear that, I sort of start walking the other direction. Uh, but the, sorry, which, what was the question? You mean for what you're looking at here? Yeah. But that's automatically guaranteed because I'm starting with the input to the circuit. I, I already know that the, it's only evaluating on a query. I'm starting with a secure two, two, uh, two message protocol. So, I guess you, uh... so inherently, so where I'm looking at here depends only on the query that the client was sending, not on I, but the query that he was sending in the original protocol. So the only thing, the only thing that's going on, security falls exactly in the same way. The only thing that's being improved is efficiency. Here you had to do some uh, computation size n or more circuit. Now here I'm achieving that by this crazy data structure. Okay. Okay. So this is actually all I'm going to say about the standard peer with preprocessing, where the servers doing the preprocessing. Let's kind of take one step back. <laughs> And look at this public key doubly efficient peer. Just to remind you, so the goal is that suppose that there's some trusted set of phase, either a trusted party or, or few of us running a one time protocol, takes X and encodes it into some capital X and also posts some public key associated with it. Okay, and maybe there were secrets in this generation, they get destroyed. Nobody needs the secrets. Okay, and now different clients come along. Each of them want some uh, index of the original database. Uh, and given just the public key, they'll be able to access a small number of positions in this encoded database. Okay. Uh, I don't want, so there's no shared secrets between the clients. Note that that's the case. Uh, and of course, that the accesses uh, that are observed are hiding the, the indices that are actually wanted. Okay. Um, Time so maybe this is like a formal definition of the. You interested in formal? Can you tell that the same location has been accessed twice in a row? No, you should not be able to tell. Yeah, and then that's a it's a good point. So kind of you inherently need some kind of randomness in this. Okay, so I think actually I will go through, even though maybe this is a little bit dry here. Um, so somewhat more formally, what's kind of the syntax? So say I have some, you know, you know, we kind of explicitly split this into two parts, some kind of generation and encoding procedure. And if you want to think of these as the same, same uh, chunk. Okay, so this part is what's done by the trusted party. And now this, everything that's blue is going to be stuff that's thrown away. You don't, you don't need it. Aside from the B and the MPW, that one's clearly very important. Okay, um, and uh, the green stuff is public. So this, 
in particular, the public key, and, and this is public in the sense that it's, we don't know it, right? But it's not hidden. It's not something we're trying to hide. Okay, so now I'm a client. I see the public key. Um, I know my, this is the, the per party kind of secret information, the per query. There's I is the thing I want. There's some randomness I'm choosing to generate the query. This indicates a, a subset of positions into this encoded database. Um, and I, I effectively tell the server, I want these symbols. Um, I get those data values back. And as a function of that, and also note that kind of the secrets that were that I, I generated as part of the query generation, I can decode the, the desired value, the ith value of the original database. Okay, correctness is as you'd expect, non-triviality. I want it to be that that the number of query, like number of positions I'm looking at is small. And the security, so what does the server see? Note that the server does not, I mean, this is exactly kind of the point that the server doesn't see the, the secret key. So he can't do the, the pre-processing, but somehow the pre-processing was done. The server uh, even say knows the public key, the original database, the encoded X, uh, and it sees the, the positions here that were queried and it should not know what was the desired index. Okay, good. So this is the public key version. Yeah, on my question that was asked before, so if I reveal whether our queries are repeat, does it get substantially easier? So, um, it seems that like maybe do, maybe randomly permute. The, yeah, the this is. I think. Yeah, I think you could basically just do. It's like ORAM, but if you never have repeat queries, then I think you can just do a one-shot permutation. At least in the secret key yeah. setting, it should be. But you're yeah. so you're allowing secret yeah. updates on the server. There's no updates. There's no updates. Okay. So we're not like that. Basically, this trivial solution does not work for us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So now I can gr like grade out the things from the previous slide, and the secret key version is going to be similar but not the same. So in this case, um, so this is now going to be all kind of done by a client. So the client's generating the secret key and doing this encoding. Okay, now the, the encoded database is, is going off to the, to the server side. And the queries, in order to query, now in the secret key version, you need to know the secret key information. So this is you know, less desirable, but this is something we can get more of a hold on. Okay, and similarly to decode, you need the secret key information. Okay, this is all done on the client. Um, but the kind of these properties down here are, are, are pretty analogous, actually. Again, so ah, okay. So, so this, yeah, okay. you could think about how would you like, where would this be useful, right? Yeah. So, say like the client does one one time pre-processing and, and then uploads oh. to this to the cloud to the server or something, or yeah, or you can have like outsource the process to somebody you trust, and then you just need the secret key, for example. Okay. Okay. Okay, just to, so so these are kind of the two notions. Um, just a, a quick mention. So suppose I told you that there's this conversion from the secret key to the public key version. If I give you obfuscation, this is actually maybe not such a surprise. So take like these secret uh, secret algorithms. Suppose I start with this secret key version that require the secret key. Okay, now stick those in an obfuscated box. <laughs> um, and effectively, what I'm going to do is, is this obfuscated program is going to be posted as the public key. So the, the you know it takes as input what were the other the other inputs that you needed, for example, for the query or for the decoding, uh, and it hides the secret key inside of it, but allows the the rest of it. And okay, so it's, it's not immediate. Immediate, you have to do a little bit of work. You have to authenticate to make sure that the box is not being used in ways it's not supposed to. So, so do you, you want to feed the randomness as an explicit input to this or let the thing generate randomness in its I head? do, I do. Be, oh, it actually it doesn't really matter, um, but it needs to then output the randomness. Like you, it needs to be that you need to know the randomness that was used for the query in order to decode. But I, I don't really, I see, yeah, I don't really care. We, we wanted to keep this as easier if this is a deterministic okay. program. Good. Okay, um, yeah, for some, some cryptographers in the group. 
Um, I, we don't know how to do this with the weaker notion of obfuscation. I mean, we didn't try like super hard, um, but, uh, but interestingly enough, there might be challenges in that. So there was this work back in 2015 of uh, Ashraf and Segev that showed some kind of black box separation actually from, if I give you IO and one-way functions, it's not clear that that actually gives you private information retrieval. So it doesn't really fully apply, but maybe this is something to be aware of. This doesn't have anything to say anything about like doubly efficient or anything. This is just generic. Yes, yes, just, just generic. Yeah. Um, so you already have it, so that's not that you're talking about. It's, it's interesting. So the um, this secret key version, and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to push this to the side. There's there's things that are a little non obvious, but this is not something I want to, to take my, my minutes on. Okay, uh, things I do want to take a little bit more time on. So so even I'm focusing just on this weakest version, the secret key version. Um, and what do we know about it as an object? So obviously it's it's hard. We don't really know how to build it uh, from even strong tools. Um, <laughs> what, what can we prove it implies? Well, it's a little bit comparatively a little pathetic. Uh, it does imply one-way functions. Uh, basically, you can, so that this is kind of the details of why is that the case. Um, and actually, I don't even want to get into it. I can go into the details if people are interested. And not OT or public key encryption. Uh, we don't know. It's not clear. We don't know, yeah. 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 Um, the complete assumption we don't know how to do it. Right, 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 yeah. What? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit. Yeah, it's a good point. Okay. Uh, something that's that's maybe a little bit more interesting is that this this object actually implies a locally decodable code. Okay. So first of all, a locally decodable code, this is you know an object in encoding theory, which allows you to take some message, okay. For example, the database X, and encode it in some way um, that you can recover recover symbols of X, even if, so, just by looking at a small number of positions, and even if there's errors uh, in in this code word. Um, so, okay, so obviously, so our notion doesn't have any sort of uh, error guarantees. Everybody's you're assuming the server is giving the right values and so forth, um, but it does imply such a notion. Not a huge surprise because the, we do know that that uh, private information retrieval implies these things. Again, so I'm, I'm not getting into it. Uh, this, I don't, I actually don't even know that this implies private information retrieval. We've kind of backed off so much with a secret key version. So this, this is not trivial, but it's a similar approach um, via some kind of smoothness. So roughly speaking, in order to, um, in order to have security, it means that the positions you're looking at need to be at least computationally independent of, of the index that I want to query, which means you have to kind of spread them around, uh, which gives you some kind of local decoding property. Okay, so, so this is particularly interesting to me for one reason, which means that in some sense, this, is, this kind of guides where do we need to go in order to construct such a thing. Okay, so that, that if I want to build the secret key DEPR, I kind of need to start with maybe a locally decodable code and, and build from that. Otherwise, what we're going to be doing is a new way of, of designing locally decodable codes, which actually is also interesting, but uh, there's been a lot of work already in locally de decodable codes. We might as well leverage that. So, so maybe I'm, uh, I, I might be wrong, but uh, isn't the implication to locally decodable codes from multi-server information theoretic here? That implies the Easily implies locally, I guess not easily. Oh, I see, I see. But single server PIR, it may not have a locally decodable code. In yeah, it. so you're right. This, you're right. This, this is is multi-server. Um, what we're doing, but it's a similar sort of, it's a similar approach. It's not, it doesn't fall directly, yeah, but it's a similar argument. Okay, and finally, so going back to uh, who asked, but some the question of. What about implying something like public key encryption or oblivious transfer? Um, and the answer is we don't know. And not only do we not know that this object, uh, whether it implies public key encryption, but as Yuval said, even the concrete assumption that we're going to have a candidate construction of this from, we don't know if that implies public key encryption. Um, but in some sense, for us, 
in a particular setting, we actually take this as good news um, because you'll see in a second, the candidate, like the assumption that's underlying this, uh, if it did imply public key encryption, that'd be a bit suspicious. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay, so we'll get to it very, very soon. <laughs> So the next kind of chunk I have a, a few slides about, I want to tell you about what does this candidate construction look like of the secret key doubly efficient pair. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna be focusing on sort of the simplest version. There's a, a few different variations and so forth. And this was in, in two uh, concurrent papers in 2017. Okay, I said that this is based on a new assumption. Let me first introduce you to what this assumption looks like. Okay, it's some form of permuted low degree curves conjecture. Um, for everything, I'm just gonna draw it in two dimensions. This is much, much easier, um, but you can consider this in a multi-dimensional version. And in fact, in order to get the parameters I quoted, you need higher than two dimensions. Okay, so it's going to be an indistinguishability type definition. And on one side, we're going to start with low degree parametric curves. Okay, low degree in the sense of say that this is, uh, so this is to say that this is like capital N by capital N, okay? What do I mean by these low, de low degree parametric curves? I mean, um, evaluation points where the first coordinate is dictated by some low degree polynomial on the parameter and the second coordinate is dictated by some other low degree polynomial on the same parameter. Okay, so these can maybe like cross around or whatever, but it's, it's not, it's relatively low degree. Okay, we'll have lots of them. Distribution two is going to be the same thing, except instead of having a low degree polynomial in each position, I just have a truly random function in each position. Okay, so I'll pause for a second. Um, clearly, these are not indistinguishable. <laughs> you can distinguish them, right? Uh, or at least however, I, however I've, I've written them. <laughs> this is sort of pairs p1 of t comma p2 of t. Yes, yes, exactly. And so I've drawn it as a curve just kind of Right. for viewing purposes, but you're right, it's actually just a collection of, of points. Yeah. Okay, but, but even as the collection of points, these as they are right now, are, these are very That's distinguishable. Right. Now, <laughs> you know what, there's an important word I have not covered yet, the permuted part. Um, for simplicity, say the entire curve, you, do, you, you don't need in, just like a subset of points, actually. You can even, I'll show the construction in the next slide, you just need like, a random collection of enough points on this curve. Okay. So they're just points. Yeah, yeah. In fact, neither, neither of them really are curves. They're, they're just points, but these points happen, they would interpolate to something smooth, and these are just like totally random. And they're given as an unordered set of points, not like an ordered set. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, so the, <laughs> ignore the curves. These are just for <laughs> demonstration purposes. I mean, you actually consider high dimensional. The what? Yeah, yeah, okay, so in, in the higher dimensions, what it is is each coordinate just is either a low degree polynomial or each coordinate is say truly, truly random. And yeah, so by the way, so as the dimension goes higher, there's even more structure. So it becomes a stronger assumption, um, but it gives us better parameters. So it's, it's also a trade off there. Right now it's, it's broken just by looking at one point. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, very broken. So I'm like <laughs> on the verge of actually describing this. And indeed, yes. So there's one very important part of this, um, which is that we're not going to give you access to these, these plots of points. But instead, once and for all, I'm going to sample a random secret permutation on the, the n squared. So this is a full shuffle of the whole n squared points. And in each instance, you do not actually get to see the curve as it is but you see the curve with pi applied. So each of these is permuted. You can get as many samples as you want. Keep pressing a button, kind of getting either from here, say, or from here. Um, and the version that you get, the question is, once I, I apply this, are these indistinguishable? And, and note, first, first of all, if I just give you, say, one sample or a small number of samples, this is information theoretically the same distribution. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. So you pick the pi once and for all, and you keep doing it for many, many. Yes, yes, many, the same pi every single yeah. time. And th yeah. this is where, right. so eventually you kind of use up the entropy of the permutation. So you have to be computational. Yes, yes, exactly. So at some point this becomes where it has, it's a computational uh, question. Can you do have the computational right. algorithms to distinguish these things? 
Okay, so this this uh, this is sort of the underlying assumption. Okay. Now, uh, so now let me describe to you what is the the construction. Suppose that this holds. A. Okay. So as you might expect, this generation procedure is going to sample a random permutation. Okay, because so you can think of this, this, this stands for pseudo random permutation. I basically just need, I want some sort of uh, compressed representation of something that's random enough. Okay. So otherwise, uh, I mean, the, the construction correctness and everything holds for truly random permutation, but the storage would be very high. Okay, so this is just compressing the representation there. Okay, now for the encoding, start with the database X. The first thing we're going to do is encode X using a Reed Muller code. This is a locally decodable code. Okay, roughly what does it mean? So take the symbols here, say we're over some finite field. Okay, stick them in the corner and do a low degree extension of, of this thing. Okay, very proud of parts of this slide. <laughs> so, so this is kind of, this is encoding as this degree roughly square root in surface. Okay, and the final step, of course, so I, I have this, and I'm going to, the thing that I actually, this is the final encoded database that I give to the server to, to hold on to, is going to be this, but permuted with pi, which is uh, shuffling all the coordinates of this thing. Okay, so suppose now I want to make a query. So the secret key, I know what pi is, and I'm interested in index i, which is some index of the original database. Okay, so uh, for those who have you know, taken the coding theory class, um, how you would normally decode a Reed Muller code is you throw a random line here, say here, you'd query all the points. This would, so that would correspond over to here. This would allow you to interpolate the curve and, and extrapolate what's here, okay? In our case, I'm going to do essentially the same thing, but instead of a line, I'm gonna do something that's higher degree. This is going to be for the part of the secrecy that I'm going to need, okay? So here, this is going to be a random degree, lambda here represents the security parameter cur curve through this point, okay? You can think of lambda as something like polylogarithmic uh, in the, the database side. Okay, so, so this, this is what it's going to be. Note that this point corresponds here um, I think that is this one I'm less proud of, but you can still kind of see here. So, so this curve, this is like the floor. Um, and what I want to do is I want to query enough points on here to, to again, to interpolate this now higher degree curve. So before, if this was aligned, the degree of the, the, the one dimensional kind of thing curve that I'm cutting would be square root. And now because my, my floor curve is, is a lambda, now I need roughly lambda square root and plus one points in order to interpolate this thing. Okay. Okay, so, so choose, basically there's this curve, I'll choose enough, a random collection of enough points uh, to, to interpolate uh, with, with this point removed. Okay. Good, okay, good. So these, these are kind of the points I'm, I'm querying. And now using read Muller decoding, which is truly just now interpolating sort of like taking what is this thing, flattening it out and doing a polynomial interpolation, I can recover what was the value stored in this position, which corresponds exactly to the, the i entry here. Yeah, actually, so I shouldn't have put these dots here. You, you, you can, it's best if you do it where you don't query anything in the, the message position, it keeps it a bit safer. Okay, so now what's going on? So this, this kind of explains, and feel free to, to stop me if you have questions, this sort of explains hopefully correctness. How am I doing the, the recovery? And now what about security? So what the server sees is that exactly points on some degree lambda curve, okay, oversampling this, it's, I'm getting something like square root and lambda points on the degree lambda curve, but these points are permuted. Okay, so this exactly kind of falls back, uh, modulo some small details to the assumption from the previous slide. So, right. so, so this is a general template to go from any locally, I suppose, smooth locally decodable code uh, to, to, to. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes, for sure. And, and the corresponding under the underlying corresponding assumption is just that whatever the distribution is there, if you yeah. permute it, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the square root of n, you can make that smaller by choosing like more variance. Uh, the, yeah, exactly. So, so this is like the two variant. And when I'm saying dimension, I think it's some point. So this is like a two variant read mark. If you crank up the number of variables, then the, the degree drops down. So you need it to be polymorphic. Mm -hmm. So in like that in the server seeing we include the database already in our some information about the plan as the alter information about the physical database. Um so the information that's being learned is uh you sort of massage it right. The information that's being learned is exactly like um, uh, Permuted. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I'm abstractly thinking, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I was sort of uh, not explicitly mentioning this. Yeah, the view, it's like enough to consider that the guy just sees the positions of them because, for example, the data contents themselves can just be encrypted. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Okay. Um, so, given time, let me just kind of. <laughs> briefly say a few things because i want to to shift gears soon um so what do we know so far about this candidate and we'll see the the underlying assumption um so it's proved in in this other work this is kennedy holmgren and richelson um, that if some sort of bounded query security does hold provably and maybe not a huge surprise um standard decoding attacks so what do i mean i mean trying to decode read muller codes heavily heavily relies on needing to know kind of what do the different positions of this code word mean. Um, I maybe don't want to go so deep into these things. Just a quick mention. Uh, so there are variants of the McLeese crypto system, this without saying much about it. So it's like some sort of permuted uh, code that, that goes out there. But, but one important difference, so McLeese crypto system with read element is broken. <laughs> this is a good thing to know. Uh, an important distinction between that case and our case, uh, so loosely speaking, that they have to kind of publish, um, the, like they, pu they, they, they publish like the, pub the public key information there is kind of some version of the, the generator matrix, which is something that we don't have to reveal, or rather we're kind of putting obfuscation on, on top of that in order to do something with the public key. Um, so it, it seems like the attacks in that case don't apply for us. Okay, this I don't want to mention, but there's a like a totally generic learning approach that um, say we apply here. Okay, I should say, however, that there are if you kind of back off or change some things about the assumption, we do know that versions of this can be broken. So, for example, if I don't have a permutation, but I just try to do the read more uh, with noise, um, decoding attacks will apply. They're actually quite good in these sorts of regimes. Um, and, and kind of the amount of noise that you would need to add in order to drown out the signal there would be too much to be to be interesting. Also, by the way, if you just permute the X coordinate or the Y coordinate, um, some of these may be like good exercises for you to go that you can break it. If you have a public linear encoding, um, so for example, if you had some sort of linear LBC, locally decodable code without a permutation, this you can break. And also if the decoding is linear in public. So for example, okay, this goes back to another question. If I always use exactly the same interpolation points, then, then this is something a bit dangerous. And uh, so even more recently, this is these are two notes that were posted on, on ePrint this last year. Um, so in, in one of the 2017 papers, we put forth a, like a weaker version of the assumption, a toy challenge. The big distinction is instead of having parametric curves, you effectively have the special case where the first coordinate is always just the parameter. So this is like now a function, for example, here, and this is a random function. And it really uses the fact um, in particular that, that I know that there exists like these columns that will always have exactly one dot in it. And that kind of helps separate things. And then you can put linearization on top of it. So this, this is together with uh, Justin, who's here, Fermi, who's here, and more Weiss. And, and another group did it independently. Um, and also in these papers, so this was like an original toy version, but there's new toy versions. <laughs> and, and this, basically this attack does not apply to the actual candidates that were in the original papers. 
Okay, so in my few remaining minutes, let me now push, push the burden onto you guys. Uh, so here's some interesting open questions. First of all, the <laughs> first challenge, break the assumption. Um, there's a lot of people in this room who I think would do you know, <laughs> a, a very good job of that, or at least taking a look at it. So again, kind of what is the flavor of the assumption? Um, it's like these parametric curves where you get collections of, uh, of the permuted values. Um, and even, even a little bit more explicitly, so, and I didn't, didn't kind of write it on the slide, but exactly this issue, say that each time you get a random selection of the points. So the, the choice of the parameter is different. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you're, this is if you're a pessimist, if you're an optimist, supports the assumption, okay? Uh, <laughs> so ideally, we'd love to have some sort of relation reducing, uh, showing security based on some kind of more standard assumption. Um, that might be challenging, but that would be really interesting. Another kind of approach to try to do is to rule out different classes of attacks. So for example, in the work, this is the work with uh, Justin and Moore from 2019, we at least address this class of statistical query attacks and could rule them out. Of course, we could unfortunately also rule them out for the, for the toy <laughs> version, which is broken, but this is still something that can be said. Okay, and uh, so this, this is like a very specific with these low degree curves, but you can actually consider this as a broader class of assumptions, which I think is actually quite interesting. Um, so, so here the question is, suppose I have two, you know, other choices of distributions. Say I have pictures of cats and pictures of dogs, okay? Is it the case that, uh, so certainly now we have amazing technology for distinguishing, you know, you throw it into some neural network, tells you this is a dog, this is a cat. Now, suppose I, I have a once and for all, choose a permutation, like shuffling the, the pixels. Is it, do these things break down? The having weight of cats and dogs is the same, right? Suppo yeah, suppose that you take from distribution. Yeah, I tried to match it up. So this is like kind of more green, this is more green. <laughs> suppose that you have the basic statistics are, are the same across them. Um, so, so for example, like convolutional neural networks, which are really good with images, do use proximity of things. I am not a machine learning expert. Um, those who are more into it, I'd be really interested in, in talking and seeing, does this kill or, or, or is it sort of agnostic to the actual choice, the coordinates of positions of these pixels or not? Okay, so kind of a more theoretical side. So this was, um, a, this notion was, was put forth in the original 2017 paper. And in the 2019 paper, um, Justin Moore, we looked a little bit more in detail about this class of problems. So, but there's still, you know, we, we made some progress, but there's still a lot of questions that we don't know. So for example, what properties are necessary or sufficient for this, this kind of transformation of easy to hard? Uh, I'd love to be able to prove something like this. If the original pair of distributions have some property, then when you permute them, now they're indistinguishable. Something like this would be really interesting. Um, another class of things that we looked at, suppose, can you show that based on assumption why something that you know, we believe is, is true, then that there are these pairs that somehow the, the, the permutation can give hardness. Uh, so like pairs of distributions that on their own are distinguishable, but now based on this assumption why, when I put the permutation on top of them, they're provably indistinguishable. We have a couple examples in the paper, and by the way, LPN itself can essentially be, be viewed as a form of this directly. Kind of cute. So you're saying you can come up with examples of these this sort of permuted puzzles using- Yes, yeah, it's like, you know. we're sort of choosing what are the pairs of the distribution. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so this is kind of one thing, but looking at the underlying type of assumptions, the other is looking straight to the goal, to these, these objects, these versions of peer with pre-processing. Okay, and, and um, there's also a ton of questions here. As I said, uh, building even, even the weakest version of this, the secret key DE peer from any kind of standard assumption. Um, so for example, we, we were kind of excited for a while. Maybe we can turn this permutation plus noise somehow tied to, to like a learning parity with noise thing. Maybe that that could imply hardness somehow. Uh, we weren't able to do that, but I think that's still a really interesting direction. <laughs> and quite honestly, our bar is pretty low here. <laughs> so anything, anything, as I said, even take obfuscation, okay? Can you build this? I'd be really interested to hear. 
Um, okay, so so this obviously this is maybe one of the the downsides, depending on how you feel about this new type of assumption. Um, but but there are interesting things even with this new assumption, if you believe it or you're you're kind of sufficiently happy with it. And it does give a lot of good properties, and this might be worth pursuing even further. Can you get like good concrete efficiency? Um, trying to better understand the relation between these different notions, also notions like the you know batch pier that we'll be hearing about soon, and even before. So, for example, in the other kinds of settings, there are questions looking at things like incremental database updates. Can you? How can that kind of incorporate? Are there upper bounds, lower bounds? There, we don't know. Okay, so uh, to summarize and, and we can conclude. So, so first of all, remember at the very beginning, kind of the main message of this talk, we're looking at single server private information retrieval and trying to bypass this inherent linear server uh, com computation time. And there's a couple of different ways of doing that. So in the next talk, you know, stay tuned, you'll see a different version. And what I've been talking about is a version where you're encoding the database. Okay, so we talked about these three different notions, a little bit about relations uh, between them and also other objects, um, and, and focusing a lot on this candidate construction. Okay, so I've already talked about the open directions. I'll leave these up here. And with this, I will conclude. More questions? So right now it's exactly dictated by the size of the read encoding. Um, so what exactly it depends a little bit on the trade-off space that you that you want. And so with read molar, like as you okay, as you increase the number of variables or like the dimension of this thing, the number of positions that you have to create drops down, but the size of the encoding gets bigger. So there's a couple of different trade off points, but but short version is that we, we haven't been like trying to optimize this. So can I just think about that? The most efficient and then, then you can get it uh, in the same complexity. Um, yeah, so roughly, except that the assumption also ties. If you're saying it's like a totally different type of structure, low read recordable code, then you're, you're right that it, this framework exactly gives you construction. That's exactly the overhead. And the thing that also changes with it is what is the, com the computational assumption, the hardest assumption. It's that basically permuted kind of queries from this query set and look, don't reveal what is the thing that you're trying to, to access. Um, I, I don't, uh, Actually, it's a good question. So, what are these? It's like these multiplicity codes that have rate one. I don't remember exactly the query complexity is. Um, oh, okay, so there's some maybe. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely definitely trade offs and sort of the. But um, yeah, this is something that we're, okay, we're trying to look at. I think it would give asymptotically pretty good numbers concretely. I'm not sure. Okay, I think we are behind time. So, um, we'll take more questions. All right. Thank you a lot again.